Good to be with you. Good to, uh, to see you as much as I can. Anyway, um, this business about animation, it's, it's, it's overdone, you know. Oh, happy day. Happy day. It's what's in the inside that counts. But uh, I think it's very interesting. Uh, you know, I, I said to you last week, I think, uh, I was sort of joking. Uh, we started on James, and uh, there are certain things I make sure I'm not going to go there again. <laughs> and, uh, and then that Lucy November, she comes and brings what she brought this morning. I think, oh, why didn't he Richard keep her at home or something? Uh, because I think it's very important that as we just refresh her for a moment and look at that, that we see that there is a, a, a purpose in God, A, of a place of peace in spite of anything and everything, because that's a supernatural thing. Uh, it actually goes beyond that, and let's just turn again uh, to that first verse. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask of God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. Now, I think it's just as we come into this, and uh, it's a very interesting book. I did encourage you to, to look at it and... Uh, I'd still encourage you to do that as we, um, in different weeks, come to work our way through this. And as you have thoughts and insights, to actually um, share them, either give them to Debbie for me or email me, um, so that we can share in this together. I think it's very interesting. Um, We're not going to go over that that we covered in the previous time, but I did want to just touch on it. Uh, as introducing us back into this. And I think what Lucy brought this morning helps us to do that uh, very well. Because one of the things we came up with was that, yeah, we know that there are various trials and tribulations and so on and so forth, and that's life and things happen and so on and so forth. We concluded, as we have done before, that the issue is more about um, how we react to respond. There are many things we can't do anything about. What we can do is choose in the power of God and by the grace of God, how we're going to react and respond. And we always got to keep that in our thinking. If we have, as we say, in God, dominion, authority, power over sin, nothing can make us sin. And we can choose our actions, we can choose our reactions, we can choose our responses. And I think as we just uh, were drawn to look at that again today, say, yes, there's a place of supernatural peace, a place of um, being seated together with him in heavenly places, which is about what God does, not about what we can do. Equally, as we said when we looked at this before, there's a place of knowing a joy as well as a peace, which is not to do with outward circumstances. And it's what he has purchased for us. We've been singing this morning about and and expressing our gratitude for the cross. Sometimes to just reflect and for a moment to, to plumb the depths of what is obtained for us in that. It's a supernatural living. It's not living to a certain value system. It's not living with certain principles. It's living from a different life source. Out of that, the different principles and the different uh, ways of life flow. But the essence is we're switched in 
to live from a different life source. We're enabled by the power of God to know peace when it doesn't make any sense. To actually experience the joy of God, which is way beyond anything that we can talk about in terms of enjoyment. This is what he's purchased for us. But I want to go further than that because I think over and above that, above the experience of peace and the experience of joy, is the very fact that it's in the purpose of God that we know his presence. Now look, as you enter into his presence, you know, anybody that's experienced that, most of you have, you know that it's an indescribable, incomparable experience. Because we're actually coming into what we were designed for. We're coming in to the very place that God has purchase and ordain for us, that we should know the presence of God. Nothing to do with a building, nothing to do with a nice place to be. It's to do with what God can do for us in any given situation. And it's what he does. Let me underline that again, the fact that we can actually enjoy uh, that knowledge of his presence that, I don't know, how do you describe it? How would you describe it? It's, it's something beyond any earthly experience. It's not something that can be obtained through drink or drugs or nice things or excitement or anything else. It goes beyond that. It goes into the place that we were actually designed to be. And that is part of what he's purchased. Not just the place of peace, but... It's what he's got for us, not just a place of joy. In respect of what's happening, it's what he's got for us. But to actually know his presence. Isn't that wonderful? To actually enjoy his presence. What a place to be. That we, who have nothing to commend ourselves, can actually walk with God, know his presence. And as we were so excellently taught last week, can chat, and it's a, it's a two-way conversation. You can actually hear him. Because as many as are the sons of God, led by the Spirit of God, and my sheep, those who belong to me, know my voice. It's all part of that provision. So I want us to um, keep that in mind as we look into that next verse that I've just read. And I'm not going to really go beyond that because as I'm looking at this um, James stuff again, I'm finding that it's really so so punchy, um, so intense, that I think there's a great danger that we kind of skim across it without actually re-drilling into it. Because remember, God's interest is that we live in the reality of it not just have the knowledge of it. So Bible knowledge is useful, but experiencing what God wants is his plan and purpose. And so let's look into that together. Let me encourage you again. Um, As we've gone on in preparing for this and reading on, it really is absolutely uh, fascinating stuff. Any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach and it will be given to him. Principle of the kingdom. Absolutely fundamental principle of the kingdom. Asking. Ask and it shall be given. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. You know, this this principle is absolutely vital. Even comes down to how we conduct our lives. You know, if you're sick, ask for the elders. I mean, there's a constant uh, repetition of things. That You see, asking is a position of humility. Humility is what's required uh, to enter on into the kingdom of God, unless you be as a little child, unless you have that level of, of humility. So, asking says you have something that I want or that I need that I don't have. It's kind of humbling, you know? Um, 
would you help me get to that door? All right, well, in theory, I could just about do it, but a lot easier with your help. But there's a recognition you have something or can do something. And we have to see that that's a principle. And often, and you would have had this conversation, you would have said to someone, well, have, have you asked God? Oh, no. Well, are you completely stupid? Well, no. Are you totally thick? Well, no. Do you know that's what you're supposed to do? Absolutely. But have you ever stopped to think, why don't you? you? I mean, we all know it. I know it. You know it. Why don't you? Well, very simple, because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. We have to understand that there's a powerful spiritual force that would stop us doing something which is fundamental. It's not difficult. It's simple, but the times that we resist simply asking and there's no good reason for it, simply because we're recognizing and we need to recognize there's a spiritual factor that would stop us taking that vital step. I don't want that to stop us taking this vital step. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm sure that nobody would say, I have sufficient wisdom particularly when we define what the Bible's talking about, about wisdom. So clearly, the, the action here that we're looking to as we gather, not just to receive information, but to enter in to the Word of God, to enter into what God's saying, is a simple step of asking. And I would be disappointed if we allowed that enemy that seeks to obstruct and be against us to stop us actually doing something which is basically pretty easy. It's just, why don't we do it? Because the enemy would stop us doing it. So ask, and that's the, the key thing, the starting point. If we recognize we need more of this stuff called wisdom, um, and then the next step, I suppose, you know, there's a need, and then there's a want. Uh, you can identify a need, but then that can translate into want. Otherwise, we're just in a silly situation of saying, I know I need, but I don't really want. I mean, that doesn't really make sense. Now, I want us to just step out of the action that we can take into that basic reason of why should we want anything of God? What, what causes us to want? What causes us to want something beyond where we are at present? Well, Philippians 2.13 tells me it's God at work in us that creates the desire as well as giving us the ability to do His will. So look, think about it like this. If essentially... There's something stirred in you, either because we talk about it or because you see it in the Word, and it's a desire. That's not just a natural operation. That's God at work creating a desire. Now, the God who we love and serve, who we've been worshipping and singing to this morning and declaring, is not a God who creates a desire and then as we go to take it, whips it away. So, follow me through. If it's a desire created by God, and if there's a response that we choose to make, we're actually onto a good thing. Because God is at work in us, causing us to desire. So, as we go through, if you think, yeah, right, this is what I want. I want this wisdom that we've just read about. I recognize there's a lack. I recognize there's something more that I need. That's come through the goodness of the word, but it's also come as it becomes a desire, a want, because God is at work at you. God is at work in you. And there's an enemy that would seek to cause you to stop asking something which you would say don't even make logical sense. But it gets better than that. It says, ask, 
and it will be given. Ask, and it will be given. And, and the good thing is, without reprimand, that means without being sort of told off. I heard once of a, of a conversation between a husband and a wife. And no guessing. And um, the wife said to the husband, would you like another sandwich? And the husband said, oh, yes. And the wife said, pig. <laughs> now, I, I can't remember where I heard that story. But there was reprimand simply for asking. Now, the promise here is that there'd be no reprimand for asking. We're, guys, we're on to a good thing. Ask, recognizing that there's something more for us. Desire, created by God. Overcoming the enemy and not getting a clout around the ear hole at the end of it. I mean, we're on to a winner here. So, it's for our good and we can expect, therefore, to receive from God. But, look, we're going to need to define what we're talking about. What is this wisdom? What is this wisdom? Now, we know wisdom as far as this world is concerned. It's about um, being smart, knowing what to do, having the answers, being able to win... Uh, what's that program where you get a lot of money? Which one? Millionaire or something. Yeah, something like that. Or Anyway, one of those programs, which I know many of you can't answer, and I'm very encouraged that you can't, because it shows you're not wasting your time watching that. Uh, but it's not about that. It's not about being able to do the Times crossword, you know, in quicker than me, about three minutes. Don't worry, I've never done it. Not that stuff at all. So what we've got to do, we've got to help ourselves by putting that kind of aside. That's, that's an earthly wisdom. And let's have a look. You have to jump on a little bit in James to get a definition of what God is talking about here. And James 3, verse 13. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above. It's the wisdom of this world. Look after myself or me first, last and always. It's the wisdom, it's, it's kind of the prevailing attitude, the prevailing mindset. <coughs> we can't blame Mrs. Thatcher for all of it. Um, you know, there was a, an element of, that was introduced through uh, those policies, as well as, of course, as you full well realize, she saved the nation. Um, but this is not a political debate. But there was an introduction uh, into the national psyche. But we are not of this world. We're not in this kind of first, last, and always mentality. So we don't want to lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above. That's the bitter jealousy, selfish ambition, arrogant. But it's earthly, natural, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist... There is disorder in every evil thing. All right, read on to verse 17 so we get the definition. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, and good fruits, unwavering, without Hypocrisy. It's God likeness. It's God in us. 
or indulge me because I've developed a new word. It's godliness. It's like what he downloads to us so that we become more like him. It's his characters, it's his attitude, it's the very nature, the very quality of God. The very quality of God <coughs> that helps us and transforms us and causes to be a, a people that represent him. You realize that in all that God's given us to do in the world, and it's vital and valuable that we do that, we show what he's like. We are salt in the earth and light in the darkness. That there are real and practical things to do, and we're engaging in doing them. But equally, you do realize that's not enough. That's just one aspect. There's something that he wants of himself to as it were, ooze out of us. And it's described here very, very succinctly uh, in this James 3.17. So it's the opposite of men's wisdom, all right? Basically, in the kingdom of God, in the wisdom that's from above, you actually gain by giving. Now, that is not something in my years in stockbroking, that I learned. We gain by actually investing in a wise way. But it was always in order to get. In the kingdom of God, you gain by giving. <laughs> it gets more weird than that. You live by dying. By actually giving over our life, dying to self, we actually live. And we actually rise... By bowing. You remember so often we've said, the way up is down. I decrease for his increase. See, we're understanding that this wisdom from above, this wisdom of God, this stuff that God wants us to have and live in is supernatural. Now, stay with me for a bit. We're not going to go too long because I know this is a bit more sort of intense, but remember, we're, we're moving to the point where together we're going to overcome the enemy that would seek to draw us aside and say, why ask? We're going to ask, but we're going to ask on the basis of recognizing we need, having a desire, and also seeing the desire is actually created by God himself. And we're going to ask, therefore, understanding, he's not going to turn us away. He tells us to do it. Tells us that we won't reprimand us for doing it. Tells us that he'll actually give. I mean, here's a thing that you can ask with an absolute guarantee. Isn't that good? There's an absolute guarantee. You will get this because of what he says in his word. An increase in his wisdom. So let's just look at the, this a little bit together. Pure. Um, pure is without contamination. This is not like um, doing something to get a response. This is not love with a hook. Um, years ago, uh, in the church, there was a young couple that uh, came, uh, they moved on, but they came from a different part of the country. And uh, they came to me and they said one day, you know, our parents have said they want to buy us a car. Wow, that's really nice. Uh, so that we can visit them each weekend. And they said, no, we, we've turned down the offer because that's, that's love, but it's with a hook. That's giving in order to, to gain something. We don't want to be involved in that. This is pure means without pretense, without self-interest. It means about not accommodating, um, not kind of just putting up with. It would be like if we choose to minimize sin, oh, well, there's a lot worse things in the world instead of actually standing out 
and say, no, we will turn aside from that. Not avoiding to challenge something because it's easier, because, you know, you know, I just like to keep the peace. It's about being prepared to speak the truth, even in a, an, an emotionally charged situation. And we'll hear a little bit about that in a minute. It's about giving, uh, giving kindly. And what I want to do is, every so often, just so that we keep this in the, in the real world, just kind of think about examples. And to help me with that, um, some of the people that have been helping me in looking into this have given me some examples. And I think I might have Jamie's one now. So this bloke called Peter um, wanted to communicate that he wanted to, to love his wife and give her the first of all the good things. So he would, of the two dinner trays, take both out and he would give his less favorite one to his wife, but he'd do it first. And it would look like, here, I've got you a tray, thereby making sure that Peter kept his preferred tray for himself. Sneaky, isn't it, really? Um, I mean, what, it, it's a nothing, isn't it? You know, what, what are we talking about? A tray? You know, it's, it's, it's pointless. But what does it show? It shows something different on the outside to the inside. And where does God look? Where does God look? On the thoughts and intents of the heart, yeah. You say, but it's so, it's such a minor thing. Guys, God deals in minor things and uses those things to actually deal with the, with the changes, the decrease, in order to be replaced with his increase. Very, very significant. Peaceable. This is not just about keeping the peace. Oh, I like to keep the peace. I don't like to upset anybody. This is not about compromise. This is about restoring relationship. This is about resolving issues. See, we have to understand that God's peace is of a deeper nature. God's peace is of a higher dimension. It's about pushing beyond the supernatural to bring the real. Part of our culture, I think it's still part of our culture, is... Um, so just be nice on the outside, you know. Um, it's kind of, oh, well, I, I didn't like to complain. Um, I thought it was horrible, but I didn't like to say. Isn't that, is that still part of our culture? Anybody want to speak to me? You can say no. It is very British. Thank you very much. And my brother from Nigeria. <laughs> okay. God is not pleased. Now hear me. God is not pleased when we smile sweetly and we're all nice, but actually inside there's issues unresolved. Because again, where does God look? He's not really keen on a kind of just, oh, we're keeping the peace, just an external thing. He wants us to be right and pure right the way through. Peaceable is not just about being nice on the outside. Equally, it's not about being a warmonger. Uh, it's seeking to restore relationship and reconcile. Michael, are you there still? <clears throat> These are just little sort of everyday things because I want us to earth this in the reality of life. Um, so, uh, a, a person, I'd have to change you the names, take, I think. No, take, take center stage, by all means. Yeah. Um, so, uh, a friend of mine uh, was, was planning for, for her wedding, and uh, her parents had given her loads of money to do this. Uh, she was speaking to me one day and saying, well, actually, I got a message from them saying they want it all back. Uh, we've booked the venue, et cetera, et cetera, all the wedding stuff. Uh, but they've called me and said they want it all back because it's not quite going as they'd expected, and various different things involved. And I was like, oh, that's rubbish. 
Um, and she was obviously very upset. Uh, and it was quite a kind of desperate situation for her. And it was, you know, we're going to have to get a loan and, and get in even loads of debt for this and all this kind of stuff because quite a sizable sum of money. Um, she was very upset. It was very easy. It would have been very easy to say, oh, yeah, that's really rubbish. You know, that's, that's terrible. I can't believe you, that this has happened. I can't believe that they've done that to you. That's, that's awful, um, which is generally how she was feeling and generally what other people were saying. Um, but it felt like I needed to be a little bit awkward in the situation and, and, and bring something a little bit different to what maybe was wanted or what other people were saying. Um, and so what the, the kind of thing that I was bringing to her every time she brought it to me, which uh, was, was basically, look, I think you need to sort this out. I think you need to speak to them about it. I think you need to deal with the issue and try and actually make this relationship with your parents work. Whether they give you the money back or not, I don't know. And I don't think actually that's the important bit. I think the important bit is that you, you, you're okay with your parents and that you actually go and speak, speak to them about it. And she was angry with them. Uh, she didn't want to do that. Um, but yeah, it was just very awkward and something against what she would have <coughs> wanted and something against what other people were saying was, look, give them a call. Speak to them about it and see if you can get some forgiveness going on here. See if you can get this thing sorted out between the two of you. Money, yeah, okay, that's, that's awkward. But really, that's the important thing. Yeah, thanks, Michael. It's very difficult when everybody else is saying, oh, what a terrible thing, what a terrible thing. You know that it's right to come in with something different, which uh, is to bring resolve rather than to reinforce that division that could have gone on for years and years and years. Uh, peaceable. We're talking, remember, about godliness, how God wants us to be, but not just how he wants us to be, how he's choosing to empower us to be. So in this time, in this particular book, this particular teaching, we're looking at um, how we grow up into him, how we become more like him. So it's, an, it's a teaching but equipping time. It's merely a teaching if we don't enter into what the word says. It's an equipping if we then receive from God according to his plan. Gentle. Uh, gentle. You know what phrase we use about coming in an opposite spirit? You know, people will be grabbing at things and then we decide to give instead of grab. Just a completely opposite spirit. Uh, everybody's trying to get to the, uh, to, the, to the buffet first and we open the way and let somebody go in front of us. Just an opposite spirit. It communicates far more than even words. And this story, uh, and I'll tell it to you, um, because I'm not sure, it's about PJ. And uh, in the West African um, culture, uh, there can be higher levels of animation than the, the, the rather restrained, restricted, and, uh, and limited British. Um, that would even extend, I believe, to as far as Nigeria, would it not? Yes, yes. I mean, we're, we're different cultures. So much so that if you're in Sierra Leone, uh, people might be having a conversation and you think it's just about on the verge of a major fist fight but they're just talking about the weather or whatever it is they talk about you know but then there are times when it is an argument and I've had the privilege of sitting in on some of those and even being on the receiving end of some of them so um, this is where PJ was in a situation and he didn't tell the story. Somebody else told it to Jamie and it got afterwards. But there was, uh, he was dealing with somebody who was extremely, uh, not only irate, but seeking to, uh, seeking to get a response, trying to escalate the situation. And in the goodness of God, PJ, who can be quite animated, you know, I have seen that as well. But he was just doing what God wanted. And he was, if you like, a soft answer, turns away wrath. Afterwards, 
This person said to somebody else, and it came back to us, that they were trying everything they could to actually provoke him. But he chose, in the power of God, in the wisdom of God, to come in a different spirit. And God empowered him to do that. And it had a far more profound effect than if he'd have just responded in the natural or traditional way. Gentle, coming in the opposite spirit. Uh, you know, I've heard, uh, I think it was quite recently, I um, can't remember who of you told me about this, but um, it was one of the teachers saying, if you, you're shouting at kids that are fighting, does, it's like pouring petrol on a fire sometimes. There's a different way sometimes coming in, in quietness. And one thing for sure, that we have to be very careful. <coughs> Excuse me. That if we enter into a debate or an argument and we win that argument, but we end up with the same contentious spirit, we've actually lost it. You can win an argument in the same way as you can win a battle and lose a war. And God requires that that gentleness, this godliness, is expressed in that way. Reasonable, persuadable, ready to come into line with God. You know when you drive down the road, you, you see a give way sign? Anybody ever notice one of those? You know, you just ignore them. Okay, all right. A give way sign. That, that readiness to yield to. And we're not talking about becoming uh, wavering, but the readiness to yield to what God wants. I want to react or respond like this. I have made up my mind. I have decided. Do not try and confuse me with facts. I've got an opinion. You know, Essentially, being open to reason, reasonable, persuadable, and certainly ready to give way to God and what he wants. Not talking about wavering. I'm not talking about double-mindedness. I'm talking about being prepared to yield to God, being correctable, seeking to understand reasons and motives that are in operation. Not being dwelling in insecurity where we can't be corrected. Uh, and I'm not talking about that kind of cultural thing. Oh, well, we agreed to differ. Uh, there may be certain applications for that, but to me that is often like choosing not to resolve rather than um, something that looks nice and polite. See, being reasonable sometimes means we need to listen to a little bit more, including some strange decisions that we might pick up. You can feel strong about something, but still be open to reason. This is, this is godliness. This is wisdom from above. This is how God wants us to be. Yeah? So, um, over the years that I've been traveling to Sierra Leone, to begin with, I would always get a culture shock whenever being there, thinking, I just don't understand what's going on. And um, just like Dad was saying, sometimes you'd be think, thinking, oh my goodness, this is about to get ugly, there's about to be a fight. And then you realize, oh, they're just talking about football. Um, and I'd often, I'd often think, I just don't, that's just a crazy decision to, to do that. Or why, why is the community so important? I don't understand how it, how it works. And there was one time I was with uh, PS and we'd got, got a taxi. And um, as we were, he negotiated with the driver a fee to take us right down to where the ferry was because we needed to catch the ferry. And the, the, they'd been negotiating and they'd agreed that he wouldn't pay a full chartered fare where we'd take control of the whole taxi but he could take other people in, in the taxi, and so they'd agreed to that. Then he got us to the ferry junction, which is still a little way away from where the ferry is, and tries to drop us off there and demand the fare. So Pierre said, no, the agreement was that you took us down to the ferry. So he said, I'm going to get out here, and I'm going to change my money with the people that are selling on the roadside because I'm not going to give you the full amount that you're asking for. So he gets out of the car, and he starts... Um, the, the driver gets out behind him, and I'm just watching this thing. Who, who have I got to punch? Where have I got to punch someone? Because, you know, I'm pretty good at fighting. And um, so he's pushing P.S. in the back, and P.S. said, look, 
we made an agreement, you've, you double back on that, let the people decide. I'm thinking, what are we doing here? This is really weird. And so, first of all, so there's like five people selling things. So Pierre steps forward and explains how he'd come about the agreement. And then the driver stepped forward and explained how he came about the agreement. And they just, they said, well, well, no, P.S. is right. And the driver's like, all right then. So he gets, in back in, he gets back into the car and drives us the rest of the way, complaining. But not only was it amazed me that we set up a, a jury just at an instant, that it was accepted, their ruling. And, uh, and what I find amazing, like, where could we do that in Dagenham? <laughs> I, I can't th see that happening, but about being reasonable is being able to be persuaded and to understand the motives behind. So when I thought, well, this community thing, I don't really understand it. I think it's putting priority in the wrong place. I think as I got, to, as I got persuaded, I thought, ah, there is a reason for this. There, there is a value behind the decisions that are being made. There, there's a reason um, behind it all. Yeah. So <laughs> taking time to just see why is somebody... Uh, feeling that way or acting that way or taking that position, uh, basically being reasonable. Merciful. Merciful is setting people free from punishment. Uh, we've often said you, you really know that you've forgiven someone when you feel as though that they got let off uh, and it's not fair. Um, but looking for redemption. See, in the kingdom of God... Uh, we stand by righteousness, but we're always looking for redemption, uh, not just uh, to indulge in punishment. Um, merciful, not getting what we deserve. And that's how God has treated us. He's a merciful God. Not being gratified in someone's failure, someone's demise. That shows a wrong attitude altogether, not being judgmental. Good fruits... Uh, good fruits are visible, they're attractive. Their fruit is created to, uh, to reproduce, to bless others. Um, and if fruit is good, it will be taken and it will produce. And the nature of the fruit, the nature of fruit is we reproduce after our own kind. So if we dwell in the wisdom of God, we basically will produce good fruit. Uh, that which benefits others, uh, which is useful and good, visible and attractive. Impartial, not biased, not prejudging, uh, not a misplaced loyalty, pure, not placing higher value on some rather than others. Uh, we'll look into that more uh, as we go on in James. Not being... Not being two-faced, uh, impartial, uh, being the same uh, to one person as to another. Um, looking at God's value system, being prepared to accept difference. Uh, you know, we're all different. God dwells in difference. Uh, he has a unity which exists in a diversity. Uh, I think if you were all like me, the world would be perfect. But clearly three of you from your response don't. The rest of you clearly agreed. So. All right, impartial. Gain of purity. Without hypocrisy. Sincere uh, with integrity. Actions and words match. We've said a lot. We believe in integrity. We know that God loves integrity. We know that God can cope with all sorts of mess if we're just prepared to be open and and respond in his way, uh, being prepared uh, to be the same on the outside as the inside, actually living in what we know to be right. Here's a quote we picked up uh, listening to something, I think it's in one of her books, but something that Joyce Meyer said the other day, thoughts lead to words. You know, what's on the inside often comes out. Words often lead to actions. We want the right ones. And it, we've got to understand where it starts. It starts back. You know, it starts in a... Um, a good thought is, hmm, I'd like to help you, I don't know, paint the wall. 
uh, a word is to actually say, let me help you paint the wall. The action then is, oh, I'm painting the wall tomorrow. You said you'd like to help. It follows through. Actions can help to build character. And character is part of what? Part of what determines destiny. Because you see here, we're talking about the character of God. Character of God, the more we embrace that, the more we receive that, the more we're fitted in the purpose of God, the more we can fulfill the destiny he has for us. A couple of other just interesting things as we conclude. In Exodus 35 and 36, Bezalel and the artisans, they're filled with the Spirit, the Bible says, and operating with wisdom in their creativity. And the indication here, and something which I'm sure that we would subscribe to, is that this wisdom, this ingredient that comes from God is necessary for us to really fulfill what he calls us to be or calls us to do in the earth. In other words, for us to be true representatives of him, we need that wisdom from on high. And Ecclesiastes 10 verse 10, wisdom, part of the ingredient that brings success. It's an added ingredient. It's the thing that we see. It's not about knowing the answers and having the clues. Things that we often see. We're seeing it in the very age that we live. The government of U-turns. Where there's something missing. There's an intention. What's missing beyond anything else is the godliness, the heart of God, wisdom of God. So I'd like us to come uh, we're going to come back for a, a time of worship, but before we do that, where did we start off? We started off by asking. And if, as we've gone through, and I know it requires a deeper level of concentration and, uh, and, and sticking with it, but as we've gone through and defined wisdom, if you have settled that actually you lack you need more of this godlikeness or godliness. Then I want, before we do anything else, to move this from a teaching into an equipping so that we actually seriously come before God and ask Him to confirm His word with signs following. Namely, that we receive a new measure, an increase in that, that word that I've invented called godliness. Can we do that now? Okay, take a moment where you form your own words about asking for a greater measure. Whether you call it his character, whether you call it his nature, whether you call it his spirit, personality, whether you want to list off particular things that have been defined as we've looked in the scripture and looked at each of the descriptions. Now is the time to do the very thing that so often we get hijacked from doing, and that is to ask. I'm going to suggest that I might lead us in a prayer, and you choose whether you participate in that. For those who want, you can... Add your agreement to this, whether it's verbally, out loud, or silently, essentially saying, yeah, this is for me. So, Lord, we receive your promise. And for those of us right now, Lord, that say we need to be more like you, we need more of this wisdom from above, this which is defined even as we've looked at it today in your word, pure and peaceable and gentle and reasonable and full of mercy and good fruits and unwavering and without hypocrisy. Lord, that we might be more like you. We just choose to ask you now and just bring back to you the promise that you make to us. 
that you will give it to us without reprimand. We receive it now because of your promise that we might be more like you. Amen.